we can slowly start. Um, so, in a nutshell, this talk will be about Ceph. So, uh, just a quick show of hands, how many of you guys have used Ceph before? Okay, quite a bit. So, did you actually deploy your own Ceph deployments, or were you simply end users, the consumers of the object store? Uh, deployed. Deployed. Okay, cool. Um, so, let's get started. So, also, any one of you who actually deployed OpenStack at one point or the other knows that one of the key decisions which you have to make when deploying OpenStack is what do you want to do in terms of storage? So there are several components of OpenStack which require a persistent storage for uh, one reason or the other. So for example, Glance requires it for storing VM images. And then you have things like Cinder and Nova which require it for block devices. So with that you can go either with Cinder and with Nova for block devices or with both. So many people use block devices managed by both of those, but in principle you could go with Nova only for deploying VMs and then only use Cinder for providing the block storage to those VMs. And then also there's the object storage component. So when deploying OpenStack you have to satisfy those one way or the other. So on a small scale in POC deployments, uh, what we see some of our customers doing is simply going with the default local storage drivers for all of those components. So for Glance, you would go with configuring Glance API to simply store the images in the local file system. Um, so not distributed over the network anyway, unless your, uh, your local file system is actually an NFS mount. Um, the same with Nova, so one of the default drivers for Nova is to simply store the ephemeral and the root disks locally in the hypervisors and the local file system, which in a special case can simply also be an NFS mount. Uh, Cinder, the default driver, the default reference driver for Cinder does the NFS driver, which allows you to configure Cinder volume services to store the volumes on the NFS mount. And then you also you might want to deploy Swift. So that's called small scale or POC. Small scale because obviously if you're storing those images only in a single node for Glance, it's not really scale. Um, so for a larger scale, you typically have a choice between either going with a proprietary storage appliance um, or doing it yourself. So there are some advantages and disadvantages to both of these options. So we see also quite a bit of people simply trying to solve the storage problem for OpenStack themselves. And typically what they end up choosing for that is Ceph. So uh, this is the slide from the latest user survey from April from the Austin Summit. So as you can see, Ceph is clearly the RBD driver of choice for majority of the OpenStack deployments uh, which were submitted to the user survey. So it is quite popular in other words. Well, is it free, is it simple, is it flexible? So many people claim it is. So um, to have a bit closer, closer look whether that's indeed the case, uh, what we will do in the next slide is we'll have a brief look at a very short case study following a Ceph admin. So for your reference, the color orange on the case study actually refers to Ceph. Okay? So that's pretty much it. <laughs> so yeah, um, not so simple, in other words. <laughs> Uh, okay, but why is it? I mean, there's many people doing SEV and uh, doing really great things with it, but then again, there's also some people who actually, uh, they start, off, start out with SEV and actually fail to deliver on what they expect in terms of either performance or reliability. So part of the reason for that is uh, SEV definitely is quite complex, it's flexible, but it's also a bit too flexible for newcomers to wrap their heads, uh, heads around that. Uh, so in other words, it's simply very easy to miscon misconfigure with Ceph deployment. So there's many reasons for that, uh, but the one which we will be focusing on during this talk is the fact that when deploying Ceph, you talk about this thing called a SevOSD node. And a single node, which is uh, the thing you see in the center of the, of the slide, is actually composed of multiple SevOSD daemons running on the node. And what you typically do, that's the best practice at least, is to assign a single OSD daemon within an OSD node to manage the data stored in a single disk. So if you have four disks in your node, you will end up with four OSD daemons typically. Um, so part of the challenge, uh, in other words, is to figure out how many, for your, uh, for your uh, applications, how many daemons, how many disks 
per single OSD node you need and also how many OSD nodes overall you want to have in your set deployment. So this is what we'll try to discuss over here and those are some of the questions which we'll try to answer. In other words, how many uh, OSD nodes per node do you want and also what's the best, air quotes, OSD node hardware from a purely pragmatic perspective. So what we'll be talking about here is we'll be focusing more on starting out with Ceph rather than going to the really large scale. Um, so just to have a, a, a bit closer look at the agenda over here, uh, we'll start off with a little background to what we do with OpenStack and with Ceph and why having a highly performance Ceph cluster is very important for our engineering team on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we'll then proceed with a brief uh, Ceph 101 just to paint a rough picture of what Ceph is and how it can be used. We'll then proceed straight to business with invest investigating the some of the considerations when selecting your networking, um, CPU configuration, number of disks, memory for your set OSD nodes. After that, we'll do a brief compar comparison of fat and thin nodes, so fat is dense in disks, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to draw some conclusion by conclusions by the end of the talk and maybe answer some questions. Okay, uh, let's get started. So, um, my name is Peter Vahovic, I'm here with Bright Computing where I look after integrating our product with different cloud platforms like OpenStack, AWS, and also Azure. Um, I also help out looking after our own OpenStack and Ceph based private cloud which is used internally for developing our product. Uh, the product itself um, does the challenging part it allows cluster administrators to easily deploy, manage, and monitor entire clusters of, uh, for various different reasons. So it allows you to deploy HPC cluster, an OpenStack cluster, so in other words, say OpenStack public or private cloud, Kubernetes clusters, big data clusters, so Hadoop and Spark, uh, and so on. So the challenge with that is it's a clustered product. It runs on multiple different nodes, and therefore whenever we test it, we also have to test it across multiple different nodes. So, in other words, what I'm saying is our engineering team, specifically developers, QA engineers, support guys, they have a huge need to very easily spin up huge amounts of VMs inside of our OpenStack uh, private cloud and then deploy our clustering software and those VMs. So, yeah, so that's in principle uh, the challenge. So, there's a uh, part of, another part of the challenge is that the product is quite flexible, so there is a huge variety of different configurations of clusters which you can possibly deploy. For example, you could deploy a single cluster which combines HPC functionality, OpenStack, Kubernetes, and Hadoop, and that's all within the same management layer, basically. So, yeah, that's why we need to create many VMs to test at least the most popular of the configurations and cover as much of the field as we can. Um, another reason for this is, well, you don't want developers to be running around your data center, plugging in the cables themselves and creating the clusters they want to test, right? They want to have, they want to be able to create clusters really fast, otherwise they will simply not be that motivated to actually test something or, or develop something if they have to wait like two hours or ten hours to get a cluster up and running. So um, the way we're solving it is with OpenStack and Ceph. Uh, we call our solution which we have implemented in our cloud cluster on demand. So in practice it allows our, uh, our engineers to create clusters in under two minutes. So we're making heavy use of Ceph's um, copy and write functionality over here and you're basically instantiating new clusters from pre-built head node images which are located in Glance. We do a copy and write to Cinder to create volumes from that and spin up the head node, provision the compute nodes, and you can pretty much do it in only several minutes per cluster. So we're happy, very happy with uh, this approach. Well, I won't be going to details of the implementation over here. Um, so in a nutshell, this is how it looks uh, from the side. So on the base we have our OpenStack private cloud, which by the way has been deployed with our product also, so we're effectively dog footing our own product to ourselves. Um, and then within that, in the upper right part, you can see the individual clusters which are running in the private cloud. So those are the clusters which are created by our engineers. Uh, we call the cluster Crust the Cloud. Um, it's about 17 hypervisors running at any given time approximately 400 VMs. Right now we have about seven, seven OSDs. Uh, we're planning to extend that to uh, 10 OSDs total. 
by the way, right now we are actually converging hypervisors and several SDs on the same nodes, but uh, we found it's not really the best practice, and what we'll be doing is we'll be splitting those up into separate 10 nodes, no longer converged to with the hypervisors. Uh, there's some screenshots of the management interface we used to manage and monitor the cloud. So the cool part about is that you can actually manage and monitor both the OpenStack layer, what's inside of OpenStack, as well as what's underneath OpenStack, so the actual operating system. But again, I won't be going into details here. Likewise, I won't be discussing this diagram in detail. So I only put it here in the slides in case somebody wants to look at a bit more detailed architecture of our cloud. So you can download it from the slides, uh, from the proceedings later on. Uh, and simply have a look, email me if you have any questions. Uh, but in a nutshell, what you have over here is different control planes, API planes, uh, code compute plane, networking plane, the storage cluster. So that's basically in a nutshell our reference architecture, which we also recommend to our customers. But uh, we build our own cloud quite heavily. Fo uh, focus, uh, it's our OpenStack cloud is heavily based on that. Uh, so, in a nutshell, we create many VMs and we have to create them swiftly. So, uh, Ceph 101. So, in a nutshell, what is Ceph? Well, it's a software defined storage solution. It uh, provides you with the capability, well, it offers you object storage capability, and on top of that, on top of the object storage, allows you to also expose that object storage as block storage and also as a file system, so that's CFFS. Um, it's quite popular with OpenStack specifically because of a very good integration with it and the copy and write functionality which I've uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, it's hardware agnostic, but well, we have to be careful here because uh, it's easy to simply pick uh, wrong hardware and have your Ceph cluster not behave uh, optimally. Um, in a nutshell, it's based, Ceph itself is based on a system called Rados which stands for Liable Autonomous Distributed Object Store. So just to have a quick look at a um, very high level view of the SEV architecture, underneath you have the Rados component I just mentioned, and you have the libRados component, which is basically a set of libraries which you can use to access the object storage, and then on top of that you have other functionality built in, like RBD for example in the middle, which is used by Glance, Cinder, and Nova to actually access SEV and store data. In. Some key features of Ceph, well, it's reliable. What does that mean? So, um, it means that every single object, every single piece of data you put into Ceph is stalled, stored in multiple different replicas. So, by our one replica, I mean one instance of the data. So, we typically want to go with either two or three replicas, which means that every bit is stored in two or three different places. Effectively, on two or three different nodes, depending on the number of replicas you have configured. So, in other words, if one of the nodes goes down, you still have some other replicas elsewhere. Uh, it's autonomous, so it means that it's self-healing. So if one of those nodes goes down and you, leave, and you lose one of your replicas, Sev will automatically take one, uh, one of the remaining replicas and replicate it to a different healthy node. So in other words, Sev cluster will always by itself strive to maintain a set number of replicas for all of your data. That, uh, that actually assumes that you have enough nodes to do that. So if you have only two nodes and the replication factor of two and one of your nodes goes down, there's nowhere to replicate the data from that one remaining node, of course. Um, distributed, so yeah, the replicas themselves by default are distributed across different nodes, but you can also configure yourself to distribute them across racks, data centers, center availability zones, whatever is, you, whatever is your actual topology. So it's quite scalable, it can run anywhere from theoretical a single node, which is not recommended, so probably you want at least three nodes at the minimum, to well, petabyte scale. So CERN over in Switzerland actually uses Ceph to support their huge number of VMs and they have been doing that quite successfully. There's actually quite a bit of very interesting talks from the OpenStack Summit down by the CERN guys, so if you're interested in learning more about that, I highly recommend that you have a look at those. Um, Another feature of Ceph is that um, the clients, uh, which want to either write or read objects from the Ceph cluster, can access the data directly without always having to go through a node which will tell them where the data is located. So the way it works is the client has to simply retrieve a cluster map from the so-called monitor node, so that's a one-time operation, and then they can use that cluster map to compute where 
object is located within the cluster and then contact that signal directly, pull the data or write, write the data to the node. So that's quite efficient in other words. Uh, copy and write, which I mentioned, really cool. Uh, so typically we talk about two or three types of set nodes. So we have the set OSD nodes, so those are the nodes which actually store the data. And then we have the set monitor nodes, and those are the nodes which maintain the state of the cluster and store the cluster map. And then optionally, if you're deploying also with CFFS, uh, you can also deploy set metadata servers, which store the metadata of the file system. Uh, what we will be talking about CFFS over here. Um, yeah, so typically when deploying Ceph, uh, if you deploy it and you want to store your data on a typical spinning HDDs, what you would typically want to do is you would want to equip your ISD nodes with uh, SSDs for so-called journaling. So uh, it's a feature of Ceph which allows the data to be consolidated in the journal first before it's being written in a fast journal on SSD, before it is written to a slower disk later on. So that improves the latencies, the client's uh, experience when accessing the Ceph, because they don't have to wait for the data to be written to a slow spinning disk, but rather simply to the fast SSD before the call returns to them. So that's actually quite important. We'll be talking a bit more about SSD journals later on during the talk. Um, yeah, so we've already seen this slide. So yeah, a single SEBOSD, there's a bunch of them over here at the bottom. Uh, typically you have a single SD node with multiple daemon, daemons running on it. So um, uh, FAT versus SPIN OSD nodes, how many, how many OSD daemons you would want to have for a single OSD node? Uh, whether it's better to go with fewer nodes which are with more disks or maybe a bigger amount of nodes which are maybe slightly thinner. So there are some advantages and disadvantages to both approaches. Uh, the fat nodes or dense nodes, in other words, uh, typically, I mean, the numbers over here are quite loose, but typically they start with multiple sockets with more than 20 HDDs per single um, node, uh, possibly several journaling SSDs per single node. They are typically the cheapest in terms of pricing per terabyte or, or petabyte. Uh, however, they are definitely more difficult to get right when you're starting out. So, yeah, I wouldn't recommend starting out with fab nodes, in other words, because you have to be quite experienced with Ceph hardware and or overall architecture of the entire system to get some things right, and we'll have a look at those things later on. Um, so, and also what I mentioned earlier was that you probably want to have your uh, ideally you would want to have your Ceph cluster to have as many individual nodes as possible. With fat nodes, which are very dense but also very expensive, it's not always possible. So that's another trade trade of your making. So in other words, you probably having like three or four very fat nodes in your entire Ceph cluster is a very good idea. Uh, sure, the numbers vary, but I would recommend going with at least six or eight nodes if you're starting out with Ceph. That will definitely help you out. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the thin nodes were the recovery times are much faster. So by recovery, what we mean over here, uh, what I referred earlier, uh, what I referred to earlier, when a node goes down, the Ceph will attempt to recover uh, the replicas. So it will take the re exist re existing replicas and replicate them to other surviving nodes. So if your node, which went down, is a fat node and it contains a large proportion of your data, that also means that a large proportion of your data has to be replicated. It's, uh, if you're talking about not so fast networking and huge amounts of data, it can, this can simply take a lot of time. So with thin nodes, that's not an issue because uh, if you have a like, thin node cluster, say you're talking about say 100 nodes for the entire self deployment, so if one of them goes down, that's like only 1% of your entire uh, object pool which has to be replicated somewhere else. So that's much faster and does not impact the end users of the self deployment uh, so much. But the downside is that the thin nodes obviously take up more space in your racks and also consume a bit more power than dense, more densely packed uh, OSD deployment. So yeah, what you will be trying to do uh, throughout the other part of the talk is to try to find the sweet spot between the thin nodes and the fat nodes uh, to get you guys started with Ceph. So um, first let's have a look at uh, networking for Ceph, specifically for Ceph in the context of OpenStack. So the first thing you would want to have in your OpenStack cluster most likely is a uh, 
IP network or, or a net, network uh, which uh, would carry the traffic between the VMs. So that's the so-called east-west traffic between the VMs. You would either want to have that based on VLANs or some overlay technology like VXLANs, for example. Another requirement is you have to have some kind of a networking for the uh, open stack and then for the VMs to be able to actually access your self cluster. So that's another networking. And then the third network is ideally something which Ceph can use to replicate data over. So uh, we've covered the replication. So when the one node goes down, the data is replicated. Some kind of networking has to be used for that. So it's if you don't have a dedicated replication network, then the replication which be the, will be done over the network, which is also used to write data to Ceph. So that mean, that will mean that if, whenever replication happens, your throughputs to Ceph will go down. Uh, so yeah, ideally a good rule of thumb is if you can afford it, if you can do it, have a separate Ceph replication network. So replication network, by the way, is also used when storing the data in Ceph, not only during a for disaster recovery, but also when storing every piece of data. Uh, what happens is um, the client comes in, it contacts the OSD, which should store the data. It sends the data to the OSD. OSD writes the data locally, say in an SSD journal, and then that OSD then selects a different OSD to store the replica of the data, sends that data to the other OSD, the other OSD writes it, so at that point you have two replicas, and only then the call returns back to the end user. So that replication also has to take place over some kind of networking topology, so ideally you want to have that over a dedicated network, otherwise writing and replication which will be going over the same cable which is suboptimal. So two solutions, the first one uh, simply have a single networking fabric, like a huge single Ethernet fabric with multiple IP subnets on top of that. So you would have a one um, IP subnet for your VLANs and, or v like VXLANs, rather, rather VXLANs, uh, one IP subnet for accessing Ceph, the other one for replication, but that's not really optimal. No, slow recovery, bandwidth will suffer, latencies will suffer because of the single sh uh, internet broadcast domain, so it's not, uh, not really optimal. Um, the, other, uh, the other potential solution, something which we employed in our own OpenStack deployment, is to have dedicated fabrics for different purposes. So you have a completely separate fabric for our VLANs uh, or VXLANs, depending on which one we happen to use in a given period of time. So we switch over every now and then. Um, a separate fabric for accessing Ceph, so that's the so-called Ceph public network, and then a separate fabric for replication, so that's the so-called Ceph cluster network. So um, another rule of thumb when it comes to networking for Ceph is probably you want to go down this 10 gigi fabric for that. So, uh, one gig is simply not enough, unless you're only doing a pr proof of concept deployment. Um, so, yeah, you, you would argue that 10 gigi adapters are quite expensive, however, all you need is a single dual port 10 gigi NIC for a single node, for every single node in your deployment, and you can pull that off. So, uh, what you would have for your hypervisor nodes for OpenStack is a single 10 gigi um, NIC with two ports, with one port uh, doing the east-west traffic for your VMs, and the other one for accessing the Ceph public network. Whereas for SEV OSDs, you would have uh, one port used for the public network, so that's where the clients come in, and the other one for, replica, for replication, so the SEV cluster network. And maybe additionally some one gigi build-in management ports if you need it. Uh, so the considerations, yeah, definitely 10 gigi minimum. Uh, MTUs, uh, so everybody will tell you that you should go definitely with uh, 9K MTU for your SEV network. Um, for both public and the uh, Ceph cluster network for replication. However, in practice, we did some benchmarks, and for one reason or the other, we did not see any significant differences between running 1500 and 99K. So we haven't yet gotten to the bottom of it. Why is the case? We might have some bottlenecks somewhere else, but in our case, there simply was no difference. So in your case, before you jump into 9K, maybe do some benchmarks and see whether it actually makes any difference for you. Okay, what about the disks? So, uh, with a 10 gig E uh, networking fabric you and HDDs, you definitely want to have SSD journals, so what I mentioned earlier, to make the writes to your Ceph cluster much quicker. Um, one thing to consider when selecting a proper SSD for your Ceph cluster is that it should be robust. And by that, I mean it should be capable of 
going through a lot of rise throughout its lifetime. So many cons consumer grade SSDs are fast enough to work at SSD journals, but if you do the math, you will actually notice that those SSDs will wear out after like one year of running your Ceph cluster. So you would definitely want to go with something more robust, more data center grade. Uh, so in our case, um, I believe we're actually using Intel DC series S3700 for that. You know, actually quite, quite a reasonable choice. Uh, the other two bullets, so yeah, uh, as you can see with a one gig fabric, which effectively maps to 128 megabytes per second, you wouldn't even be able to saturate a single SSD. So that's one of the reasons why one gig fabric is simply a bad choice for Ceph, specifically if you're using some kind of SSDs for journal. And with 10 gig, that's good enough to saturate a SATA SSD, um, but it's not quite good enough to saturate a much faster PCIe Express based SSDs, which can uh, sustain uh, sequential writes of up to two gigabytes per second. But again, that's something you have to keep in mind uh, when designing your self cluster. So yeah, here's an example. So indeed, Intel DC Series S37, uh, that's what we're using. They are capable of about 375 megabytes per second sequential writes. Um, given that, Oh, yeah, so actually that's another question. So we know that you have the SSD, and uh, that's something I didn't cover before, probably you should have. Um, how many HDDs do you want to have behind a single SSD? That's also a choice you have to make. Uh, you probably don't want to have one single SSD doing journaling for every single HDD, that would be a waste. So what's typically done is you have a single SSD which is, uh, which is doing journaling for multiple different HDDs. So also picking the number of HDDs which uh, are put behind a single SSD that's another thing which has to be considered when designing your Ceph cluster. So in this case, uh, our SSD, we, have a single, uh, we can have a single SSD in, in our node. So that SSD is capable of 375 megabytes per second, given that our HDDs are capable of about 75 megabytes per second of sequential writes, that give or take gives, uh, gives you a number of five HDDs per single SSD node. That would be a good number in this case. That's also what you'll find in other sources. Typical, typically, people talk about putting either from four to six HDDs for one single SATA SSD node. Like the exact number depends on the performance of those. Um, so yes, yeah, so we have a single SSD, um, and a single SSD is only capable of uh, approximately 3,000 gigabits per second in terms of uh, actual bits which come in via the network. So with a 10 gig fabric, in other words, what you could do is you could easily have three SSDs per single node, and that still wouldn't entirely saturate your 10 gig fabric. And then behind those three SSDs, you would have 15 HDDs totals, or five HDDs per SSD, and that would be a typical uh, optimal hardware configuration for this uh, particular hardware. But again, your, uh, your numbers will vary depending on what hardware you choose to use. So next one up, uh, how many cores would you need for such a cluster? So let's talk a little bit about uh, CPUs in the context of Ceph. Um, so one thing which you should definitely keep in mind when um, deciding on how many sockets you would have for your nodes is the fact that if you go with more than one socket, you will end, most likely enter NUMA territory. So NUMA stands for Known Uniform Memory Access, and effectively it means that a uh, single CPU has fast access to only some of the memory banks, but to access other memory banks in the system, it has to go through the so-called QPI bus to the other socket, and uh, as a proxy from there, only access uh, the other memory banks. It also impacts communication with the, with the PCI Express devices because those typically are also assigned to a specific, old, uh, spe specific socket on the motherboard. So if you have OSD, so if you have two sockets and you have um, your NIC, your 10 uh, PCI Express NIC uh, pinned to one of the sockets and you have your Ceph OSD on the other socket, when the data comes into the Ceph OSD, it goes through the NIC, through the one socket, through the QPI bus to the OSD, and then probably back through the QPI bus to the SSD on your PCI Express. So that's create, that creates a lot of potential for bottlenecks, especially if you're talking about running like uh, 40 OSDs on a single node. So there's a really amazing talk uh, which focuses on NUMA in much more detail. 
It was done at the Austin Summit by the guys from Comcast, I believe. It's called Designing for High Performance Sabbath Scale. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, they dive into the mind much more detail than I would be able to do over here. So yeah, for now, let's consider that if you want to just start out with Ceph, you don't want to mess with NUMA, you don't want to mess with pinning the RSD to specific uh, CPU sockets and all that, a safe choice would be go to a single, with a single socket motherboard. So let's stick with that for now. Uh, single socket, so how many cores for a single CPU do we need? Well, another rule of thumb is that you probably want to have a single dedicated core per OSD, so per OSD daemon running on your node. In other words, if you have 10 disks, um, you would want to have 10 dedicated cores uh, for only for OSDs, which one core per disk, so one core per OSD daemon. Um, yeah, that's pretty, pretty, pretty much covers that. So the next question, I guess, is whether we're talking about the actual physical cores or whether we're talking about hyper-threaded cores. So personally, I haven't yet seen any benchmark which would uh, actually compare a performance of a SethOSD, Seth cluster with hyper-threading enabled uh, versus a cluster with the same number of non-hyper-threaded cores. So my impression is that most people tend to use hyper-threading with Seth, whether or not that um, creates a significant performance penalty. Probably not significant. There might be some small performance, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to going through a, a more detailed study on that. In our case, we're actually making use of hyperthreaded cores. So far, it's been working out for us. Um, so, yeah, so we've covered the networking, we've covered the CPU, so how much memory do we need uh, for our deployment? So another rule of thumb over here is to have like one gigabyte of memory and node for each terabyte of data which will be stored over there inside of your self deployment. So would they like, um, with the self OSD nodes of four disks, two terabytes each, you're looking at at least eight gigabytes of memory dedicated only to Ceph. So oh, not 0.5, uh, that refers to the amount of memory and well, under normal operation, one gigabyte that kicks in mostly when you actually start doing disaster recovery, or rather when Ceph starts uh, replicating the data because one of the nodes goes down, then the memory requirement goes up a bit. And obviously, if you have even more memory than Linux, since uh, in the current most set deployments, objects are stored uh, on disks on the file system, um, if you have more memory, that will also benefit the reads uh, of your set cluster, because then several SDs will be able to make use of Linux's uh, virtual file system caching, so that whenever a client accesses a hot piece of data from the SD, SD it won't have to be retrieved all the way from the spinner, but rather it might actually be in the operating system of Linux. So it more de it's definitely better in this case, in terms of memory. Um, so yeah, one way to look at all of that, so how to uh, bring all of those pieces of information to get, the, together, is typically your networking fabric and your expectations in terms of performance determine the amount of SSDs which you will need in your cluster, right? Because as we've covered, uh, you probably want to have just enough SSDs to saturate your network. There's little point in having more than that. Um, in turn, the number of SSDs and their performance will determine the amount of HDDs you will want to have, you will want to have per each single node. And also another factor here is, of course, the performance of the HDDs themselves. So, as discussed, you would want to have the sequential writes of SSD match uh, the sum of the sequential writes for HDDs which are backed, uh, uh, which are behind that particular SSD. Um, the number of HDDs in itself determines the amount of cores you want to have. So, like we said, you probably want to stick with a single socket to get started. And then uh, the amount of the HDDs as well as their size will effectively determine the amount of memory which you should put in to your server SD nodes. Well, yeah, uh, the main takeaway from here is that this is a gross oversimplification. There's obviously quite a bit of other factors which you should also put in, uh, into consideration when con architecting your self deployment, but that's simply one of the many ways in which you can look at it. The other one, for example, would be you might know from upfront whether you want to optimize for 
performance, in which case you probably want to have thinner nodes, or maybe whether you want to more optimize for costs, in which case you want to go with a more dense, fatter nodes. Well, again, that all depends on your, uh, your budget and your expectations. Uh, so we're actually almost at the end by now. So uh, in this slide, what we're doing is we're comparing those five columns on the right. We're comparing five different hypothetical set clusters. So all of those clusters have the same capacity. Uh, what varies is the type of the node uh, of, this, of the several SD node. Uh, so we're going from unreasonably thin nodes through thin, pragmatic, regular, all the way to fat nodes. So as you can see in the first row. The total number of uh, hard drives in the set cluster is constant, and all of those set clusters is constant. So that's 96 hard drives for the entire cluster. It doesn't really matter what size they are uh, for this um, for this size. So just 96 hard drives for every single cluster. Now, what differs that's the nodes total uh, is the amount of nodes you have per cluster. So in the first example, we're considering putting a single hard drive per node. So that's why that's the unreasonably thin configuration. That's pretty much wasteful. Uh, but we have, we have it here for the purpose of comparison. Um, in the thin uh, cluster, you, you're uh, considering having 16 nodes, each with uh, six uh, disks per node. In the prag more pragmatic cluster, we're considering having eight nodes with 12 HDDs, or a nice small variation, only 10, but I will cover it later. Um, the regular cluster that would be like six uh, nodes for the entire deployment. So six is in yellow over here because we're entering a territory where recovery will take a lot of time because a single node going down constitutes a huge part of the entire deployment and therefore the recovery times will grow. And then in the FAT cluster over there, what we have is only two nodes, each equipped with 48 HDDs. So you can imagine four units over here. Um, for journals, the first one, you go with a single journal, so again, pretty wasteful. One SSD, one HDD, pretty wasteful, but you could, in principle, do that. And it's actually usable if your priority is latency, right? So if you don't care about the fact that you're wasting sequential write bandwidth, but your priority is um, write latency, then that is a viable configuration. But in that case, you might as well go with a SSD-only storage without any HDDs altogether and without any journals. Um, for the thin cluster, we have six HDDs backed uh, uh, with a single SSD. For the more pragmatic cluster, for those 12 HDDs, so we have two SSDs, so that's one SSD per six nodes. Regular cluster, three S S SSDs, and the FAT nodes, we have eight SSDs per node. Uh, so probably what, which I, what I should also mention is that uh, for all of those clusters, we're assuming that um, the sequential write speeds for the SSDs is, is approximately 400 megabytes per second, and that the networking fabric is a 10 gig network. Um, yeah, so what you will uh, notice straight off the bat is that uh, the SSD bandwidth per node line, and uh, for the FAT node, that's 25 gigabits per second. So that far exceeds the capability of the networking fabric, right? So that tells us that if we want to or need to go with FAT nodes for whatever reason, we have to definitely consider the network capacity. Because in this case, those theoretically, this theoretical cap of 25 gigabits will be simply throttled by the 10 gig fabric which we'll have in place. So in other words, we're simply exceeding the network capacity over here. Um, going back from the FAT node, for the regular node, we're actually quite on point with three SSDs, each capable of uh, 400 uh, megabytes per second of sequential writes. We actually go to 9.6 gigabits per second, so that's pretty much almost at the limit of our networking. So it's a pretty good solution in terms of utilizing your networking. And going more to the left, the pragmatic node actually underutilizes uh, the networking with only 6.4 gigabits per second uh, theoretical peak sequential writes. And uh, further to the left, for the thin node with only a single SSD, that's only 3.2 gigabits per second. And again, with the unreasonably thin node, that's also only 3.2 gigabits per second. So yeah, maybe let's also cover the rack space. So when the, going from left to right, for the unreasonably thin node, uh, you can do with a single one new unit for every node. That's, that would be perfectly enough. Then moving again to the right hand side for the thin nodes, 
that will start depends on whether you're talking about two and a half or three and a half disks. So if you're talking about two and a half inch disks, which are well, obviously more expensive than three and a half inch variants, oops, excuse me, yeah, there we go. Um, for one and a, for two and a half inch drives, you can probably fit all of those seven discs in a single one new chassis. Uh, but for if you're talking about three and a half inch uh, drives, you'll probably have to look at a two U chassis for the, for those uh, seven SD nodes. With the pragmatic nodes, um, we can go with uh, we're free to go with the cheaper three and a half inch uh, discs and easily squeeze them into a uh, two and a half chassis, uh, and also have more of those than in the previous configurations for the fern cluster. Moving up to the right hand side. Um, for the regular cluster, again, uh, the choice between two and a half versus three and a half inch drives. Uh, for 16 HDDs plus those three SSDs, you would have to go with, uh, if you want to stick with two U, you would have to go for two and a half inch drives. If you want to go with three and a half inch drives so a bit cheaper, then you would have to go with a three U chassis. And then the fat note, 48 discs, that's probably probably for you. Not sure there are any three U chassis which could handle that. Maybe they are, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so which ones should you choose? Well, like we said, you probably want to avoid the fat nodes for various reasons, specifically the requirement of having like 48 cores over here. So even if they are hyper-threaded, you're probably looking at multiple CPU sockets and therefore NUMA anyway. So you'll probably want to stay away from this one. Also, for this cluster, uh, we would have only two self nodes. So that's obviously very bad because if one of them goes down, then the other one does not have any place to replicate the data. So you only remain with a single copy of your data, and if that second node goes down, then you don't have access to your data. So that's obviously bad. Um, and you would actually think that nobody would be so stupid to try to deploy it to Seth, uh, two node set cluster, but actually I did see a RF, uh, RFP at some point which considered deploying a OpenStack cloud by backed only by two SEV OSD nodes. And the best part about this is that uh, those two OSD nodes were actually in two different regions. So we imagine the geographical latencies over here writing the data. So that's, I don't know how far that, that one got, hopefully nowhere, because it's completely unreasonable. Uh, so what I'm saying is if you want to go with uh, optimizing for storage, for, uh, for cost with FAT nodes, you definitely want to make sure that you have enough funds to actually start off with at least like six or ten of those FAT nodes and a really beefy networking fund. So we definitely don't want to go with the FAT nodes. We definitely don't want to go with the unreasonably thin because it's so wasteful. So we're uh, <laughs> left with selecting our cluster between the thin nodes, the regular ones, sort of pragmatic. Well, the names are somewhat arbitrary. It doesn't matter, but you get the point. Um, so, um, which one you want to choose somewhat depends on your requirements and performance expectations, also on your rack space, uh, power capabilities, and all of that. So, there is no single answer over here. My personal preference would be go with a pragmatic approach. That's because there's quite a bit of 2U chassis which are capable of storing 12, of having 12 hot swappable drive bays. So the 12 hot swappable drive bays, what you can do, and that explains the or 10 parentheses over here, what you could do is you could have a node which has 10 HDDs and two SDDs, thus filling out all of the 12 drive bays in the 2U chassis. And uh, couple that with a single socket motherboards because also one uh, CPU will be enough to handle all of those 10, um, 10 OSDs, you're pretty much good to go. Another alternative here for the pragmatic approach, if you don't want to waste those two drive bays for SSDs, what you could also do is you could fill all of the 12 drive bays with HDDs, and instead of having two SSDs, simply have a single PCI Express or M.2 SSD uh, on the motherboard which would provide you probably with also some better latencies with the regular SATA SSDs. That's also one of the value points which vendors present for PCI Express SSDs. Not only they are faster in terms of sequential writes, but also the entire operating system stack, a write call has to go through to get to be written to the uh, actual persistent storage is much thinner, which means there's, uh, from what I recall, only 33 or something like that latency of a traditional SATA stack. So your latency should go down by a third 
uh, when writing the data. At least that's what the vendors would like you to believe. Um, so yeah, so that's another alternative for this one. 12 HDs, one PCI Express SSD, and several of those, then you're pretty much good to go. Um, yeah, so some key takeaways. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the choice here would be to go with a 2U chassis if you're just starting out. Uh, with two, S two SATA SSDs, uh, you probably want to prefer uh, the s uh, more s slimmer nodes and have more of them if you can afford the rack space for that. Um, you, sh you, could, you should probably only go with the FAT nodes if you understand SEV really well and you can handle the complexities involved in deploying a cluster composed of uh, more dense nodes. You probably want to avoid, if you're going with the thinner nodes, you probably want to avoid NUMA and therefore uh, have your motherboards um, to have only a single socket, only a single used socket. Uh, don't use one gig networking for seven unless that's simply a small PLC. Uh, for a 10 gig um, fabric, you probably want to go with one or three SATA SSDs for your journals or a single PCI Express one. Uh, for a 10 gig and north of that, you would want to go with one or more PCI Express SSDs. Um, yeah, you should avoid small clusters in general, regardless of whether you're doing small nodes, uh, slim nodes, or fat nodes. You definitely want to avoid uh, having too few of those, and the fatter the node gets, the more network you have to have to replicate the data efficiently. Um, because, yeah, longer, longer recovery times. Uh, and yeah, in a nutshell, a six node cluster composed of uh, slim nodes recovers much faster than the uh, cluster composed of the same number of nodes, which are much denser, quite obviously. And so that's pretty much the last slide, I think. Uh, some tips uh, to consider when you're, if you're just starting out with Ceph, uh, read up on deep scrubbing because it can kill your performance. Deep scrubbing effectively performs a consistent, consistency check on all of your placement groups inside of your Ceph deployment and other pieces of data, and it kicks in automatically every week. So you might notice that every week the performance of your cluster goes down for some reason. So that's what it's coming for. You can disable it, you can tweak it, you can spread it over time, uh, read about it. Uh, QoS, so one of the other things we had when we first stood up our OpenStack deployment was um, we had a bit of VMs which uh, every now and then would go rouge and would simply spin up on the I.O. and write huge amounts of logs, for example, to the disks. And initially we weren't throttling those VMs, so all of that bandwidth went straight to Ceph and effectively killed performance for all the other VMs. So we tried to solve that by enabling QoS for volume types for Cinder, and it was a perfect solution. You selected, the tricky part was selecting the right amount of caps for the amount of bandwidth which gets written and the amount of IOPS, but once we established that for our use case, um, there, we didn't have any problems with VMs uh, sp uh, spitting uh, out too many logs because of that cap. So definitely consider QoS. Uh, might also consider RPD cache, uh, enabling RPD cache on your client nodes, uh, while it basically aggregates a lot of small I.O. into a bigger chunks, which are then only fed to the self cluster for writes. Uh, the disadvantage here is that as the data is in the local cache on the hypervisor, it hasn't been obviously written persistently, so if the hypervisor goes down in that period, you will lose the data. But that's a small risk uh, to pay for a potentially huge uh, performance advantage here. Uh, yeah, have a look at the OpenStack Summit videos. They have an awesome YouTube channel with all of the videos from all of the summits up there. So there's also quite a bit of videos focusing on Ceph with a lot of interesting information in there. So you should definitely have a look. And yeah, that's uh, the last bullet point over here is the title of the talk uh, from the guys from CERN under the Ceph cluster, which also contains very interesting tidbits uh, of information which you might want to know when starting out with Ceph. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, the slide is over here, so if you have any questions, I would be happy to talk. What sort of use cases would you um, sort of consider Ceph? generally just as a sort of storage uh, sort of solution? Uh, so typically we consider uh, as a storage, consider Ceph as a storage for OpenStack. That's how most people actually deploy it. Um, the reason behind that is uh, what I covered. So the fact that it plays nicely uh, with uh, all the com components of OpenStack which require persistent storage, so plans in their Nova. 
um, and because of the copy and write functionality. So opens, using Ceph for OpenStack would be my first priority. But that, that's just me. I remind you some people out there who simply require an object storage system and don't really run OpenStack. In which case, Ceph is also a good, uh, good choice. So I mean, as a, um, a standalone sort of storage, SDS mm -hmm. storage solution, um, is it more geared towards say things like real-time financial transactions, or is it kind of more CCTV footage type of storage? More like CCTV, because I mean, with any network storage, you will have some latency, right? So, uh, but again, I mean, you can customize, uh, say, you can tweak it. You could, you could consider having a purely PCI Express-based cluster if you have the funds for that, and the high, high frequency trading area, you would definitely have funds for that. So yeah, you could simply deploy, deploy a cluster like that, and latencies with that coupled with a good networking fabric should be pretty slim. So you could consider that also. And also, there is the SafeFS component of Safe, which allows you to simply use Safe and expose the file system to the consumers. Okay, there were some other questions there. Yeah, so assuming you keep to your kind of ratios of OSDs to hard disks and to SSDs, how will the Safe cope with a kind of non balanced or non homogeneous <coughs> cluster of thin, flat? Pretty well, actually. Pretty well. So you don't have to have your entire cluster composed of identical nodes. You can mix it up in any way you want. Uh, what I try to highlight during the talk is the fact that if you have very few, very dense nodes, that's simply a bad design choice. But it's perfectly fine to have several very thick nodes and then several thinner nodes. And is it the number of OSD nodes that sees from a particular server that will kind of affect how it's balancing the load across those? Uh, well, you can configure that, so you can assign weights to the SSD, so you can, for example, say, okay, I want to store more of my data on this particular node, maybe a bit less on this one. You can, you can also configure how Ceph spreads the data across units like racks, uh, chassis, data centers, AZs, and so on. So that's all configured. Have yeah. you done a, um, a storage upgrade where you've added nodes or added capacity, and how does that affect sort of the operation of the um, so the last upgrade we did, we actually uh, that was a cre uh, clean reinstall in practice. So I, I wouldn't be able to tell you what what would happen in practice if you were to do it on a live system, uh, but I know that it's doable. So I, what I would suspect happen, I would say might actually try to re start rebalancing the data to the other nodes. Yeah, uh, but we actually have a solution to that and. Um, in our self management system, what we have is the capability to, when you add a new node to a self cluster, you initially assign a weight of zero to it so that no new data is rebalanced to it. And then our system gradually over time increases the weight. And so more data is pulled from the other nodes and fills up that particular node due to the rising weight. So that's our way of dealing with it. It's simply part of the solution we use for managing our self cluster. It's also available to our customers. Uh, is that question over there? I was going to say, you mentioned at yeah. the beginning of your talk about big data, and um, I wondered whether you'd had any experience of people running things like HDFS on top of Hadoop. Uh, so, sorry, on top of Ceph. I know it sounds absolutely insane, but we're a, a public cloud provider, mm -hmm. and a question that we get quite a lot is you know, how can we deliver these type of work? Let's take this offline. I think one of my colleagues actually encountered that in practice. He's more in the big data team, and I think okay, they've, cool. yeah, they've, uh, uh, they've seen that, so let's talk later. I'm assuming you can just probably confirm this or say it's nonsense. Um, because Ceph does a replication for you, and because it's got the front end of the SSD caching, I guess there's not much use for RAID at all. System. Correct. Or correct. Correct. I mean, typically, uh, another rule of thumb with Ceph is to simply not use RAID because it's simply wasteful and not really needed. It might actually be harmful in some cases. Yeah. yeah. So actually, we, yeah. we run Ceph and. Uh, We've uh, configured uh, uh, stripping on some of the disks just to be able to uh, run less OSDs per node. So if you want to change the ratio, if your ratio of uh, disk per node is not right for you, you can decide, well, I'm going to have just half of the number of disks by stripping on two, two of them. Uh, yeah, so my question was um, not really related to hardware. Do you know what's the level of maturity of Using Ceph with different um, with the different OpenStack services like uh, Swift, Cleanse, Cinder, 
Um, so it's definitely very mature for Glance, for Cinder, and for Nova. So with the current versions of OpenStack, it's possible to do copy and write from Glance uh, either to Nova or to Cinder. So that's pretty much all you need. There's also a copy and write functionality when creating snapshots from volume. So if you have a Cinder volume, you want to create a snapshot of it. That's also copy and write. Uh, with the backup driver for Cinder, I believe copy and write is also there, although I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, I know that there is coming Manila integration with CFS, so that Manila, which is the file system, uh, file store as a service component of OpenStack, they also are, have been looking at CFS, so for all we know, it might actually already be there. I haven't looked at Manila, at Manila myself recently, so they might actually already be supporting CFS. Um, as for Swift, um, so Swift, the prin principle does not have much to do with Ceph. And when deploying OpenStack, you typically either deploy uh, your object store for your customers by deploying Swift, and in that case you're probably not doing Ceph, because Swift actually in itself as a component is very similar to what Ceph does, it's also a distributed object store. Um, however, if you use Ceph and you want to expose uh, an object store via a Swift compatible APIs to your end users, you would configure what's called the Rados gateway, uh, which is effectively a gateway to the Rados system of Ceph. Uh, compatible with S3 and Swift APIs. So your customers will talk to that gateway as if they were talking to a Swift deployment. So typically when you when you want to use Ceph for your block storage, you probably don't want to deploy Swift and rather simply deploy Rados gateway to offer the object storage capabilities. Can you... Okay, last question. Sorry, are those yeah. gateways deployed on the actual Ceph servers themselves? Mm. Or do you, do you have another tier of servers? Uh, I think you can do both. Yeah. So that depends on your requirements. Okay, so we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.